Hello, everybody. Welcome, welcome to the SciArt live art stream. That is some people creating interesting art. It's like a podcast, but it's so much better because you get to watch us create art and talk about cool art stuff. Uh, and so we don't need podcasts here. We have the art stream. And it's great <laughs> because you can watch us work on our creative projects while we're discussing these topics. You can also interact with us. So today I have two awesome people. I have my usual co-host Jen. Hi. And I also we also have Sarah who's joining us, uh, who does a lot of agar art. I will let her introduce herself in just a moment. So, um, if you are watching live, just so you know, you can interact with us. I'm trying out some different things with like the chat and stuff. But we are live today on YouTube for the first time. Uh, we are also live on Periscope or Twitter, uh, where you can click the video and chat with us in the chat there. Again, I'm trying something new with the chat, so we'll see how this goes. But if you have something to say, have a question, want to say something about work you do, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, and I will try to keep an eye on it and read off what I see. And if you're not watching this live, uh, just so you know, you can watch all of the archived recordings of the live stream. You can also view the upcoming schedule. And I have all of that info um, and more available on my website, which is GaiusJAugustus.com slash SciArt dash live stream. So that's GaiusJAugustus.com slash SciArt dash live stream. So if you don't know me, I am Gaius Augustus. I'm a visual storyteller multimedia communicator, um, and today I'm continuing work on something that I've been working on way too long, which is this comic that I'm creating about my trans experience and how that experience has informed really my thoughts on interdisciplinary science. And I'd like to just turn it over to Jen, if you just want to introduce yourself to people who may not have been here before and let us know what you're working on today. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm a postdoc and a um, and like to do art on the side. Um, today I'm working on uh, just a, I guess what I wanna say is like a pattern. I wanna try to make a pattern um, of cells, that, um, particularly microglia and neurons. So I'm just gonna be uh, working on that, playing around with that. And yeah, we'll see how it goes. Oh, that sounds really exciting. Um, I can't wait to see what you do. Uh, I'm going to try not to get distracted from my own art with that. Um, <laughs> so I, I love making patterns. It's just like this weird thing I absolutely love doing. Uh, so we also have uh, Sarah Adkins with us today, um, who does a lot of sci art that I've seen online. She's amazing, super cool person. Um, Sarah, do you want to tell us a little bit about more about yourself and what you're going to be working on today? Sure, but just to comment on both of you first, I, have, I haven't told you how much I love like the phrase visual storyteller, that's awesome. And wow, those neurons look really cool. Um, yeah, well, they're gonna I'm, get better. <laughs> they look so cool, I can't wait for it to be finished. Ah. Uh, I'm Sarah Atkins, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And my dissertation, I do a lot of bench work, um, but most of what I do is use agar art, or painting with microbes, painting with bacteria, as an educational tool, not just in the microbiology classes here, and in ways that we, we use to convert sort of traditional labs into open inquiry and course-based undergraduate research experiences, um, but also as a community engagement tool. So I do a lot of agar art workshops um, in the community and at community colleges across the state. Um, and I'm just really interested in, in following agar art trends and seeing how painting with microbes can be a, a tool, not just for artists, but also to communicate like real live scientific data. Um, and I think that's a really cool tool about bio art and science art in general. Yeah, that's what I do. Well, that's awesome. All right, so what are you gonna be working on today? Do you have, I, I think you showed us that you have some designs sketched out or what do you have for us? Yeah, so, so first uh, I've done a few of these designs and I guess I'll keep on working on them until I get them right. But Harvest Roots is a kombucha business here in Alabama and they asked me to to draw out some of their logo designs with agar art which is really cool um, 
I know that people who buy their kombucha, like me, are really pumped up about using bacteria for different things. Um, so I'll be working on some designs for them. And also I sketched out the logo for our art museum. There's some, someone at the art, Birmingham Art Museum who's interested in doing agar art workshops. So I feel like that would be a good design for her to have. That's awesome. And it's a little difficult for us to see the sketches, but that just means that you have to share with us the final results so I can share it all over my social media. All over. Which I have no problem with. <laughs> no shame. I have no shame. Awesome. All right. Okay. So the hardest thing, the absolute hardest thing about these live streams every time is getting distracted and not actually working on the art. So <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to go ahead and pull up my art and start working. Um, but can you just tell us a little bit more about like how you got into doing agar art, why you decided to do it, that type of stuff? Yeah, so the American Society for Microbiology in 2015, one of the largest life science organizations uh, in America, and it's also international, started putting out these contests for agar art. And if you go on their Facebook page and I think on their Twitter, like the results every year are incredible. Like the work that I do and the students here do like just barely scrape by like the imagination that the scientists and artists are coming up with to paint with microbes. And so it was that year that I started graduate school and I was getting really into pigmented bacteria for different reasons. And, and me and my advisor started playing around with the idea of using it in the classroom. But not only that, like, the, the thing about using biological art is that it doesn't come out like you expect it to. And I kept on running, mm -hmm. how can I draw this just like dog face or whatever I was drawing like better because the bacteria are alive and they're changing in ways you don't expect. Um, so we decided that that was a really critical component of making the artwork, that you get to learn information about the bacteria. So my first semester mm -hmm. I spent troubleshooting, um, using it as a curricular tool in that way. And from there we have students make those same observations, but then create testable experiments that they glean from their artwork. Uh, so that's that's really been the focus of what, what I do and why I got into it. I like messing around and painting with them. And I think it's really rewarding that students can like learn things from art. And I just get really excited about their discoveries. Um, we've learned a lot of things that we wouldn't be able to, to learn if we were just doing biochemical tests or bioinformatics on the microbes because you get to see them sort of breathing ecological information like in real time. Yeah, I never thought about the fact that like, it's not, you're not just drawing something because just because you draw it doesn't mean it's gonna come out that way because they're living organisms. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah, and I think that's, it's something that, that takes agar art in this like really, I don't know, uh, I'm stumbling to find the words because I get so excited thinking about it. But we, we can like keep all of the pictures annotated that the students have had. And I have like hundreds of pictures with microbes that we've uncovered from the soil. And it just gives us like a database of so much like ecological interaction mm. um, that is just like incredible and really fun. And it's visually appealing too because microbes make so many different colors of pigments. Mm -hmm. Nope. <laughs> It's perpetually charging my computer. Okay. So tell me, tell me, I guess tell everyone else about uh, what what your work is going towards. Uh, would you like to start, or shall I? Go ahead. So, um, as I said, I'm a postdoc, and and my work usually it mainly focuses on Alzheimer's disease and trying to come up with better biomarkers to detect um, uh, the progression of AD using um, the eye. So there are various aspects that you can measure in the eye, in particular the retina, which is the tissue in the back of the eye that converts light into um, biochemical signals. And um, so I'm particularly interested in seeing how it changes between um, healthy patients and um, patients that are um, diagnosed with AD. And one particular thing you can measure is um, the thickness of the retina. And what you do is this, you take a um, specialized micro, um, ophthalmoscope 
have it look into the back of the eye and then you can measure the thicknesses through there. Um, another thing that we're interested in is coming up with ways to um, detect the pathological um, biomarkers that are associated with um, AD, like the, the plaques and the tangles. And we're hoping to come up with a way where you could just take an eyedropper, put it on your eye and then go to your um, eye doctor and see if there's any plaques present in, in the retina. But that is the goal. And I am working towards that. I have, um, I'm collaborating with several people to try to see if we could come up with ways to do that. And I like making art on the side. <laughs> mm -hmm. We gotta have hobbies, right? Yeah, you know, like work-life balance. Exactly, but you also like, you've been working on some pieces that you're communicating your science through art too, right? Yes, so I, um, a couple weeks ago, I was working on a figure that was going to go in a review that I was um, gonna, Published. I'm working on that review right now, and I'm going through the um, the comments, and then I'm trying to see, okay, how am I going to incorporate this picture into the review now? Let's see. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I try. I I would like to um, become more visual in terms of my science communication, because yeah, I think it will help a lot. I think that's it's always difficult because we we're not like trained into that thinking, mm -mm. especially in biology. I feel like we're we're really not taught to think visually about our projects and how to communicate them. And I find that I tend to when I can't communicate the exact word that I want to say, I tend to use like a lot of words and then I bog people down with word salad and they're like what mm. <laughs> so i think like an illustration or something that like that would be totally helpful so i don't end up bombarding people with words makes sense to me yeah i know as you as you know <laughs> and and i'm so i'm no longer in academia i graduated oh, in april and i um I've been trying to find a science communication style job, but um, haven't found something like that yet. I've been doing a lot of freelance work, so I've been getting doing. I just recently finished up a um, animation project and a, a game design project. Okay. Um, one of them was science based; the other one was a little less. It was research based, but not really science. Um, and but day to day, I'm working for a biotech company. And I am um, pretty much just writing reports. And the purpose behind the reports is all to get the company uh, up to date on a lot of the new regulations that are going through in Europe. And so my mm. day job is not very exciting. <laughs> um, it's just reading old papers, like old literature. It's not, it's not oh. even like up to date stuff. It's just like kind of old literature. And looking at all the products that we have and trying to write up why they they're valid scientifically and how they've been used in the clinic. Um, and again, all the products that I'm working on are you know twenty, sometimes thirty years old. Oh wow, Ooh, that's always it's, fun. Yeah, but it's just the new regulations. We need documentation that we never needed before. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of weird because it's like you're. You're trying to say these products are valid, but they're like everyday use type of products that people use all the time. So it's kind of like obvious, but obviously not to the regulatory bodies. Uh huh. So uh, I do that in a day, and then I try to make time for my creative stuff on the on the weekends and at nights when I can. Mm. Uh, because yeah, my my day is not the most exciting, but um, but it's a it, I think it's important work because if we don't do it, then the products will go off market. Yeah. But it's also not like finding new research or developing anything really new or or novel or innovative. 
So, you know, it's fine. <laughs> Have um, you <laughs> thought of a way to get to use uh, your science communication skills in your job, like in writing your reports? Well, so there's a lot of science communication stuff that is translatable uh, because we're writing reports for regulatory bodies. Uh, mm. The people who are going to review the reports have a scientific background, but not necessarily a background in the products that we're using or the cancers that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, and then also the people who have to like sign off on the reports don't all have like strong scientific backgrounds either. Some of them have more like business backgrounds. Right. And so you have to write a report that both qualifies for the regulatory body and fulfills the scientific need, but also that the people who have to sign off on it can understand it well enough to say, this is good, move forward with it. I see. So, so there, I think there are a lot of really interesting challenges uh, from a communication standpoint that I have to kind of do with my, my job. Mm. And so it's definitely not irrelevant, uh, but it's also not as exciting as some things could be. Mm -hmm. I guess I have a, a question for both of you. Um, and that, that's where do you see yourself in, in maybe 10 years? I, I do if the stars align. <laughs> It's a great question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that is the that is the question. Um, well, I'll start. I I'd like to still be doing science, possibly um, not necessarily in a tenured faculty position, but something a little bit more adjacent to academia something more uh, focused on uh, science, probably science communication. But um, yeah, that's, that's a long way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I would still like to be um, focusing on neurosciences, but you know, that if everything lined up, yeah, that's what I would like to be. <laughs> I would be happy if the, if all humans are, if humans are still alive oh. and climate change <laughs> has not destroyed everything, all of civilization. I mean, yeah, bar <laughs> that. <laughs> but barring that uh, inevitability, uh, me the optimist, right? No, I, I actually, I love science communication. And one of the things that I really love is, so my background's in film and television and art. You know, I was in art long before I ever kind of jumped into science and when I got into science, but I already, I always loved my science classes in high school. I just was never very serious about it. Mm. And when I started in science, people constantly are like, how did you go from art to science? And my regular answer is always, what's the difference? <laughs> right? Like, I don't, because I feel like the, the scientists that I meet that are the best scientists are the people who are like really creative thinkers, like really thinking outside the box and are able to envision things um, and able to like create these workflows and drawings and concept maps that are very creative. And the people I meet who in a nice way, I don't consider to be quite as good scientists are the people who like are very worried about the status quo. This is what we know. They're never questioning that. And they perhaps don't question themselves enough or their data enough. And they're, or they're so busy thinking about the minutia of the day-to-day -day experiments. They're never thinking about the big picture. And even when they are, it's only on the concept of like where they're kind of small area of science. It's not broader than that. And I find that the more creative you are, the more you just connect the dots all over the place, even when it's inconvenient to do so. And so I just feel like science communication and art, or science, art, science communication, it's all kind of 
in the same realm. Sure. And the biggest problem that I have right now with science communication is the fact that we we tend to think of science communication as writing, even though there are other types of science communication, we think of it as words. And I mean, words don't work for everyone. Mm. And so I've been really excited to see more comics and more uh, multimedia projects, more animations and things like that all kind of coming out and co- and becoming a little bit more mainstream, but I still think we can do way better. Mm-hmm. And so if you follow my feeds at all, you know I'm, I'm very big on advocating for incorporating creative, creative things into science communication. And so how can we make science communication more than just journalism? How can we make science communication depending on who we want the audience to be, how do we make it exciting and engaging for people without expecting everyone to just like love it because they should love science. Mm. Um, I get very like peeved when I talk to either scientists or science communicators and they're very focused on the idea that, oh, everyone should love science. And First of all, science is such a broad term, right? Mm -hmm. Science means so many different things. And saying someone should like theoretical particle physics and someone should like, you know, very physical creations of organic chemistry, those are very different things. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think it's, yeah, people can be excited about both. I'm excited about both, but that doesn't mean that they, should be so excited about both that they're getting really in, ingrained in them. Uh, but I also feel like we have this idea that people should like the things that we like in the same ways that we like them. And just because we like discovery and we like to know how the world works doesn't mean everyone has to. And but that doesn't mean that we can't get them excited enough about it that we can improve science funding, which means that we can improve our breadth of knowledge and uh, the application of that knowledge to all sorts of things like health and technology. And so I feel like there's a middle ground there and it all comes down to advocating for multimedia science communication that goes beyond telling people a story about that one scientist and how they came up with this idea or even a, a story about how this science is so cool and new and innovative, but kind of goes beyond that and just says, Hey, let's tell interesting stories in visual ways that also happen to be very accurate with their science and happen to include science as a motive for moving forward. Mm. So I can see myself in 10 years really kind of pushing the boundaries, hopefully not as hard anymore. Uh, Hopefully it's like more acceptable, but of saying, okay, well, how can we talk about science in less of an educational way and more of an entertainment way? Um, Hmm. Because we're doing really, I think we're we're doing well on the educational side and there's a lot of really great research around that, uh, which needs to continue. Um, but I don't think we're doing quite as well to make it entertaining as well. And I think that's important. You know, I think that people get excited about, I mean, how many people do we know who are excited about like Game of Thrones? Oh. (laughs) Who cares about Game of Thrones? But people really care about Game of Thrones. They care about Game of Thrones because it's interesting, it's engaging, it's entertaining. And there's nothing saying that we can't have science stories that do the same thing. So how about something like the Big Bang Theory? Well, (laughs) I don't like it, but lots of people do like it. And I I think that if that gets people excited about real science and real scientists who are are doing real work to try to find the next, you know, push our boundary of knowledge, Mm -hmm. then great. Just because I like it doesn't mean other people can't like it. And I think that we need yep. to 
ask ourselves if how we can use that medium to to do more. Mm. I think it. I think that show and concept has a lot of room for improvement. Mm. But as an aside, I really like that my dad sort of like. I mean, I know it's a stretch, but it seems like he really understands what I do in like a really broad way because of that show. Mm. Yeah. He feels so good, like because neither of my parents went to college. Like it's really exciting that he he just like gets sort of how academic systems work. And it's sort of a tangent, but I kind of no. like. So like offers that perspective um, in a way that that makes like at least the public that I'm aware of like more understanding and sympathetic. Mm -hmm. like, yep. Um, no, I think that's fantastic, and that's really what I'm talking about. Yeah. It's not like it doesn't mean that your parents know more about science than they did before they watched the show, but they have an appreciation for it. Mm -hmm. And the more of our culture that has an appreciation for science, the better the funding will be. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the better the funding is, the more we can actually help society with the science that we're doing. Mm. And to me, that's the ultimate point. Right. So that's I don't know. I guess it's a roundabout way of getting there. But. <laughs> sure. <laughs> but, but TV is still a medium that reaches like a majority of people. Oh, totally. Mm -hmm. and even if you broaden that to just like media, like Netflix and like streaming and all of that stuff too. I mean, it's all over the place. So anyway, yeah, that's my that's my ten year spiel. I don't know where I'll be on ten years. What about you, Sarah? What are you thinking? I I really like a lot of the things that I'm doing now, and I wish I could do them forever, but. I'm also interested in how a lot of these ideas coincide with healthcare and mm -hmm. the public's perception of a lot of the issues that like the public needs to know about, um, both on the side of the physician and scientific communication to patients and improving patient education. So I don't know exactly what that looks like. I think in, in many of the ways you, you both don't know either. Um, but, but I think going into that field is, has room for a lot of these ideas. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. So Sarah, you mentioned that um, you, um, when interacting with the students, they came up with their own observations and stuff like that. Do you have like a story that um, of a time where a student came up with something unexpected and it turned out to be a really cool um, result? Yeah, so I don't remember exactly what the what the species of bacteria were, but there was one team that saw on their art uh, something that that myself and the TA and the professor, my advisor, thought was like surely a contaminant. Mm -hmm. uh, it was yeah, it really bugs me that I can't think of what the two species were, but it was basically a red bacteria and a contaminant that was yellow, like we're like, oh, that's obviously something different. But the students discovered that it wasn't a contaminant. There were two cultures that were simultaneously growing. So they, they proved us wrong, which I don't know. I was like, how could you do that? But I, like having spaces where students can have their own inquiry and sort of test the boundaries gives yeah. them question authority, even in small ways like that. Um, I think that was a really great example of, of a time that, that we were proven wrong. I thought like, oh yeah, surely I know more about microbiology than a, I don't know, student in introductory microbiology. But that was not the case. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really cool because th then you engage them in the scientific process as well. And they came up with their own um, their own observation. I wonder, like, would you be willing to put that like in your thesis or something like that? Like, hey, look, <laughs> this is what happened. Would I put it in my thesis? Yeah. I yeah, I think I think some of, but yeah, I'll, I published a lot on the education side. So when we came up with this idea, we wanted to make sure that it was valuable and we wanted to see the evidence behind it. Mm. Um, so we have published in the education literature about it and. And I think I went way more into depth about exactly what the students found in that. 
but it is really cool how a lot of their their observations can become like bigger experiments and in some ways they have so i'm interested there's a certain type of bacteria streptomyces that lives in the soil and is responsible for over half of all antibiotics that we use in the clinic um, it also is this it creates this molecule that is the smell that we associate after a rainfall. It releases a volatile compound uh, that is basically the smell after a rainfall. Mm. It's like beautiful pigmented bacteria that creates so many important clinical antibiotics. And, and it's, it acts like a fungus. Um, so it makes it really hard to test with a lot of the regular bacterial tools we have in culture methods. So the students, because they were isolating bacteria from the soil for their agar art and, and inquiry ideas, kept on running into this bacteria. And, and we knew little about how to work with it. So because of that, I'm really interested in working with collaborators in Biden, the Netherlands, and, and also mm. Amsterdam's VAG Academy uh, to learn more about streptomyces because, wow, they're beautiful and really cool. And that was just like one way that the students' ideas and their discoveries sort of have prompted more directions, at least in the lab that I work in. I love that. That's really cool. And I also feel like it's very empowering too. Mm -hmm. And I feel like there are not enough opportunities for, for students to feel empowered about the work they're doing and what they're, and to feel like you're discovering something and not just going to lab and doing the same mm -hmm. thing everyone else and all of yeah. that. I found that experience in science, I don't know, I feel like for a long time that turned me away from science and like wanting to get into lab work and I was really intimidated by it because there were no opportunities like in science to hold a pipette or to like, you know, go through the process of science and to fail and pick yourself back up again. It was very factual. So I really mm -hmm. that you're thinking about science as something that should be entertaining and engaging. Um, because that's certainly been my experience as a graduate student and sort of in, in the science academy, but it certainly was not my experience as a science student. No, I agree completely. And so Agarar is, sounds like a really great tool. And I'm curious, I'm curious, Jen, with you too, if you've all, if you found that like using a medium that you really maybe hadn't thought would be useful before and you kind of come to this new medium, whether that changes how you think about art in general. And I know like when I was first training, I was in art, I was trained in like, we used pencil and we did some ink and we did some acrylic. And every time you found a new tool, you realize you have to do things entirely differently. But also then when you start realizing, oh, well, I can use anything. And, <laughs> and mm -hmm. as long as they, I can put it down on something and I can create something. And I remember I took a part of my uh, undergrad art degree. I took a 3D art class and the other students, so we had to do like additive art or subtractive art where you like putting stuff together to make a 3D sculpture or taking some of like a block and removing things to make a sculpture. And I remember all of my classmates all got like the same type of stone or the same type of like whatever material. And I was like, what else can I use? And part of that, and part of that was just because like, I didn't have as much money, but it was also like, well, I don't want to do what everyone else is doing. But then it also opened up all of these like, interesting ways of thinking like mm -hmm. i i wonder if using a non-traditional medium also pushes you into more creative thinking mm. Mm. So, it sounds like that may have sort of worked for the students right I, yeah i would like to hope so <laughs> yeah so uh the first the first time that i got invited to give a talk at a different university sort of gave the pitch about why this is really cool and, and the educational assessments we had been doing on it. And then someone in the, in the audience asked me if it was truly art 
So because it was being used as a tool for science or science data collection, like, could I actually call what they were doing art? And I think that was the first time that I was like, uh, I don't know. I mean, I was also a second year graduate student in a science <laughs> department. So I didn't think I had the authority to like speak about what art actually was. But, but it did really get me thinking about like how we define art and how we traditionally thought about it also in the academy. Um, so I'm, I'm still sort of grappling with that. I think when I, when I perform these activities, it feels like an outward expression of things that I want to say. Um, and it's really challenged my ideas about art making in general. I think all of bio art and a lot of, a lot of science art in general has done that. Um, it's on the cutting edge of asking those types of questions. Like how much of what we do is art and how much of it is informational and, and does that distinction really matter? No, I totally understand. Jen, you were going to say something as well, right? Well, um, going back to you describing about not having money and it forced you to um, try think of things differently. That just kind of reminded me of, you know, I wanted to pursue this question. Uh, back in graduate school, I wanted to pursue this question, but we weren't necessarily experts in this certain technique. So it kind of pushed me to um, come up with alternative ways using the things that we actually have. So not necessarily like art related, but more science related. No, but, totally. But um, I mean, also showing that like maybe science and art aren't necessarily so um, uh, mutually exclusive from each other. They're using similar things to you know get to a specific. Uh, point. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and even within the art community, there's always arguments about like what is art. Right, right. You know, mm -hmm. like even artists don't know what art is. I remember being in art school, and you know, we get to see a lot of different art, right? And there was someone who had painted a blue picture, and that was all it was. It's like this canvas, this giant canvas, it was blue. And it was up in like one of these fancy art museums. And, you know, probably sold for millions of dollars, but it's just a blue canvas. Right. And we're like, okay, why? Why is this art? Like, why is this considered art? And how are they able to make so much more money than I am <laughs> when I'm doing more than just painting a canvas blue? Um, and it's all in the perception. And the perception of not the artists, like the, in a lot of ways, the artist doesn't even matter. It's the perception of the audience and how they view it, which is in some ways problematic because it like takes the artist out of the context of their own creation. But it's also kind of understandable is it's so hard to interpret anything without the creator interpreting it for you. Like in science, we don't just put data out there, right? We we write a paper and we tell people, this is what you should think about the data that I put out there. Mm -hmm. And you hope the, the reviewers agree with you enough that they'll actually. <laughs> uh, but in art, you know, you put it out there if you're lucky, you are putting your artwork up in a gallery where they let you put a little blurb next to it, but there's no guarantee anyone's gonna look at the blurb. Mm. But if someone connects to it or reads your blurb and connects to your message, then all of a sudden it has so much more value than some art student who's drawing something and doesn't have that venue available, doesn't have that audience available. And I think the same is true for like, you know, agar art, this, this idea of like, and we've talked about this before, Jen, on this uh, live stream, like how do you define art? Mm -hmm. And who's to tell you that what you're doing isn't art? Now, now does that mean you're gonna make money doing it? No, does that mean that other people are gonna agree with you? No, but I think if you're being creative and Creativity is part of the process. 
I don't know. I have trouble policing other people's language, even when I don't agree with them. Mm. That could be some of this. <laughs> yeah. So what did you tell this person about, like, when they asked you, like, is this even art? Like, how do you say this is art? How do you even respond to something like that? I, I think looking back, I think that I said something more intelligent than what I probably actually said. <laughs> uh, I, I think it was just something along the lines of like, well, if we can use like science inquiry, even if it's not in the context of science, like we can still call it science. Um, so yeah, I, I think it depends on, I don't like, if you think about a, you being in art school or me being in art school, like it are practicing certain, like having confines about how we are expressing ourselves. Is that art? Like if we're practicing drawing the fruit bowl or, or whatever sort of historical exercise we have to do, how much of those things are art? Is this mm -hmm. that? I mean, I, I think that's hard for us. Yeah, I think just like as you're saying, it's really hard for even artists to arrive at that question. So it's really up to the, the manufacturer, the producer, but also the audience um, and the context in which it's made. I'd like to think this is art. <laughs> I mean, it's part of the hashtag, so it is, right? <laughs> oh, you're all right. Engineering or computer science. But maybe it is engineering. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I think that you can have a very broad definition of, I think art just has a very broad definition that unfortunately has been skewed to me in like fine art and you the use of certain media and the you know like these these definitions that people like to have just like you know we, again we do the same thing in biology right like we argue about whether viruses are alive or not right and it's because we have definitions yeah but those definitions are old those definitions don't reflect every piece of knowledge that we've gained there's always an exception to that definition. Yeah, there's always freaking <laughs> exceptions to everything, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, so I think, you know, fighting about definitions isn't productive in general, in my mind. Um, I say that about everything. I say that about gender. I say that about, you know, advocacy work. You know, at the end of the day, words don't mean anything outside of the context of us trying to communicate with each other. Mm. But... Yeah. More importantly, what are you trying to get out of your agar art? Are you trying to get education? Are you trying to get appreciation for microbiology? And if you're getting to those ends, then who cares if it's art or not? <laughs> That's what I'll tell her the next time she asks. Yeah, I'm sure that will go over really well. You can just like say, Gaius told me to say this. Here's his Twitter. Go be mad at him. <laughs> So I, I have a weird question about how you decide the, what bacteria to use. Because I've never done any agar art before. And you know, you, when you go to the store to buy paints, you just choose the color of paint you want, you know? And they even like put a dried clump of that paint color on the outside of the bottle so that you know what color it will dry as because it's not always the same color as the paint is. But in agar art, it, it seems like you both have to have a really good understanding of the color that the bacteria will create, but there's also got to be an element of stochasticity or like, we'll see what happens. How do you, how do you handle that kind of side of things? Well, I guess if, if my projects today are any indication, I did it multiple times in multiple different ways because I'm trying to get a very exact design out of it. Um, but, but I think knowing, so at least in my case, like being able to see the bacteria that you're using and knowing how it like traditionally interacts with other organisms and using it frequently is one way. Um, they also behave differently on different types of media. So if mm -hmm. I'm making it on a nutrient rich media as opposed to mm -hmm. a nutrient poor media, or, or maybe I could take the, a little bit of the agar gel out and make a really sort of slushy agar that way the motile bacteria can behave more sort of sporadically, um, go all over the plate. So there's a lot of different dimensions that you can play with, with not just the strains that you're choosing and the interactions between them, but 
but also the environment that you're trying to put them in. Hmm. Yeah, a lot of it is, is random and happy accidents in terms of looking at it from an artistic angle. Well, and again, we do that kind of thing in, our, in art too. You, you don't just sit down with a new media and expect it to, the art piece to be perfect because you have to learn how the media works and how it moves on paper or whatever thing you're drawing on. You have to learn how it interacts with other things. There's a lot of like traditional multimedia artists who use all sorts of media, like traditional media, but all together. And it does weird things when you use different like types of things together. So it sounds like you're using the scientific process of art, just like artists use it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like you're getting to know the tools really well too. Right, I, I hope so. There's, there's also really cool work being done um, by different sort of pioneers of this craft in different ways. So I sort of like to go all over the place with it, use as many different types of media and strains as I can. Um, but I can speak to, to two scientists, scientist artists, um, Dr. Mark Martin from the University of Puget Sound and Dr. Hunter Cole in Chicago. A lot of their work focuses on using bioluminescent bacteria in something they call Lux art. If you've seen that mm. around Twitter. It's like really remarkable and, and I think what's really cool about it is that they're sort of just honing in on one type of environment and one type of bacteria to make these really elaborate bioluminescent portraits and oh wow uh, just beautiful things um, I, th I think it's actually Dr. Mark Martin and his wife if I I think she does a lot of the, the portraiture actually but Dr. Hunter Cole she, she makes these beautiful uh, bioluminescent portraits and she like installs them as sculptures and there's this sort of like performative element to it too like creates dresses out of bioluminescent bacterial oh, wow. wow it's really elaborate work so there's so many people sort of like pushing this field um in more than just the ways that we're using it in the context of education um so so yeah i think it has a lot to do with like knowing your materials as any other artist would I, I certainly am not as good at Illustrator or Photoshop or the programs that you both are using. There's a lot of there's a lot of learning curves to, to every type of artwork. Definitely. Amazing. And so okay, so in science when we go so we go to the literature to find out about what's going on, like what's the latest thing in our field. Um art you tend to either go to your local community and galleries or you go look at like the people who are kind of creating the newest, coolest things. Where do you go to find out the newest, coolest thing about agar art? I, I think I troll the, the Twitter hashtag. <laughs> yeah, that's as good as anything. And sci art, I, do you do the same thing? Definitely. Yeah, although I feel like the sci art tag isn't as diverse as the science art community. Oh, that's a really good point. And 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 the art that they create also isn't. Mm -hmm. So I feel like it's a little bit difficult to find people using all sorts of different media through the science art tag. Um, and I find the science communication tag is so journalistic heavy which is not a bad thing i'm not saying it's a bad thing at all um, but it is so heavy in journalism that i feel like multimedia stuff sometimes gets diluted mm. and so i feel like there's not a good hashtag yet for it i don't know mm. it's just my like current feeling about it mm. and i don't know if that's just me or not either but I just feel like I have a hard time finding multimedia science communicators, especially people who are doing like animation or video or film or things like that. And I, you know, I also feel like it's, how do I put this? Because art is less valued in my mind than other types of communication. 
Uh, I feel like there tends to be a very like uh, it tends to be a mindset that like we can't help each other out, we can't collaborate, or we don't want to because there's only so much work out there. Uh, and I've worked really hard to like promote other science artists' work and try to get other people's names out there because uh, people do amazing things. And I feel like that's that's difficult and not necessarily because of the art community, but in a lot of ways because of the non-art community. And I, I would say especially the science community. I don't feel like the science community appreciates science communication in general. Like that's its own concern. But then when you even branch that out into science art, it's like, well, what use is this to us? It's mm. not teaching people things. They're thinking about fine art. And when even fine art has its place. Um, and, but I think there's a lot of pushback from, from scientists about funding science art projects and you being able to explore science art the same way they explore their science. Like being able to explore agar art by using different microbes or trying new different interactions or new media to put the actual bacteria in. Those things are really important to the field of agar art, but they also can be really beneficial to science at some point, probably. Mm -hmm. For lots of reasons and not just like, oh, with further human knowledge, but also the idea of like, I don't know, just getting people excited about art and, and science, right? So yeah, I get frustrated because I, I feel like there's not enough of a focus in with scientists to to incorporate art into what they do and also not a willingness to also then fund artists to do that work. So I don't know. That's a whole other topic I could go on about, obviously. I guess I'm wondering what your perspective is on, on graphical abstracts. I see those becoming more of a thing and at least more of my colleagues getting more excited about thinking about how to present their work visually and sort of succinctly in ways that people not familiar with the work they do can easily digest. And they come in a lot of like shapes and flavors. Mm -hmm. And I always ask the question, what do you think your graphical abstract is for? Mm. Because I think that's an important question. Like when you think of an ab uh, a graphical abstract, what are you thinking about? Mm. Who is the, who do you think is looking at it? Why are they looking at it? What do you think people want them to get out of it? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I'm asking that question for real. Like for you, oh, like yes. when you hear people talk about that, what do they mean? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Is the audience for the graphical abstract the same audience for the paper? Because the graphical abstract isn't behind, or isn't, in the cases that I've seen them, haven't been behind the same paywalls as the entire paper. So, so maybe the audience is a little bit different, so depending on the journal itself um, and whether or not it's open source. Yeah. And when I teach uh, infographic classes, you know, and, and everyone I know who, who talks about infographics, you're always talking to the audience. And you can't make a graphical abstract for everyone. Like, right? Like, this, the graphical abstract for a scientist in your field is different from a graphical abstract for a scientist outside your field is different for a graphical abstract for a public. So, I mean, I think they're great. I don't think people are using them quite right yet in a lot of cases. Um, but I think that we haven't answered that fundamental question of who is this for and what do we want them to get out of it? But I... I always had the impression that the graphical abstract was supposed to be for at least broadening it out, um, broadening out the concepts to people who are not familiar with the field. That's what I would I I have thought because like but whenever I go, but but that's still broad, right? Right. Mm. right. Like someone not familiar with the field could be anyone from someone outside the field. So like my dad, yeah. Right. Yeah. 
but then they would be able to look at the grab strap and get like at least a broad idea of what's going on. Because mm -hmm. it's not like burdened burden with words or stuff like that. Right, yeah, I guess what is, what does that look like? What does that look like when it's done correctly? Yeah. And, and I guess how, don't how do you that. communicate a scientific topic without any words at all? And how do you, and again, like, the amount of background information you have to give is different depending on the audience, right? Mm. Like there's so many different levels of it that I feel like we haven't touched. Because if we want it to be the general audience, then that means your entire background section, like that has to be into the, in the graphical abstracts. Because if people don't understand the background, they're not gonna understand what you're putting in the graphical abstract. Mm -hmm. That is true. I mean, you could draw like little circles but if they don't have the context, then they don't know what that actually means. Right. But you but also can't to expect a graphical abstract to be appropriate for like every audience. Mm. Right? You, that's why you have to have an audience in mind. True. Right. So I just feel like when they say a lot of paper, a lot of like art um, journals now are requiring graphical abstracts, mm -hmm. but they're not giving guidance on this type of thing. Mm. I feel like we're we're not doing the best we could do because of that. And that's why journals need graphic, graphic in, um, designers like you to like guide them. That's totally <laughs> true. From the field. That's totally true. You don't know. <laughs> well, and it's a great effort, right? Like, sure. I think it's fantastic. And I know there have been lots of times that I don't have time to read a whole paper. But yeah, I want to read the graphical abstract or the abstract in general just to kind of get an idea. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, I mean, you all have seen graphical abstracts before, right? That are like completely useless. Right. You have no idea what's going on. And after you read the paper, you're like, oh, I get it. But before you read the paper, you're like, what the hell are these people trying to say? Right. But I thought I've encountered the opposite. Um, I I think one of the things is like, you have to be looking for that thing. You can't just be um, browsing the internet and then, oh, I came across an abstract. So I guess part of it is you have to have like at least some interest and some knowledge of why you're looking at this abstract. Mm -hmm. right. Otherwise it's just like, yeah, I have no idea. I have no context, yeah. but you're right. There could be like some pictures that just don't make sense. It's just like clouded and they wanted, um, the person wanted to convey so much that they just show a whole um, pathway, a signaling pathway, and you're like, okay. Or they just don't know what they're doing. Yeah. They're just trying to do it themselves instead of hiring an artist to do it. Oh yeah, if you Google graphical abstract, <laughs> you will be ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, is there like a, is there like a Twitter or some an account that posts poorly done graphical abstracts? <laughs> there should be. Oh, no. <laughs> I think I've seen a blog that does that, but I can't remember now where I saw it. And if anyone watches this and knows that blog, please like yes. tweet at me or send me a DM because I want to share it. Because I definitely remember seeing it. And I think I might have seen two or three on there before I was so angry I couldn't continue. <laughs> but anyway, so we're at the hour mark. And so we have to finish for today. This was so great. And I, I would love to have you back. Um, mm -hmm. Before we wrap up, I just want to have us each talk about like how far we got. You know, we are all working at our art. Art takes a long time. We're not, none of us ex are expected to finish an art piece in the time we're, we're doing these uh, art streams. And as usual, I didn't get very far. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I got like a panel, like this panel done. Uh, and I got some interesting backgrounds done that I'll probably still play with. Oh. And then I started uh, kind of getting the lines ready so I could start coloring. Wow. It looks so good. I mean, you're making progress. That's awesome. Yeah, wow. progress is good. Not enough, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that. That looks but, so good. I'm so excited to see it. <laughs> So Jim, show us what you got. I got, I got, I went into the weeds. So I started with a, a sketch and I just started 
playing around and I'm liking it, but I might have to tweak it as I go along. But yeah. yeah. Just remember that good patterns have areas of complexity and areas of simplicity. So just make sure you have a good balance of both. And it'll um, be great. Thanks. <laughs> and I cannot wait to see it when it's done. Like for real. I, I love I, patterns. You know, I'm gonna gonna I'm gonna finish this. <laughs> yes, you have to finish it. I know. <laughs> Sarah, what did you get done today? Yeah, I guess to show you these a little better. I drew I do this. Perfect. And yeah. and this. It's yeah. this is the logo for the kombucha company. This is the logo for my local art museum. Uh, and you can write sort of invisible ink, mm. but you can see uh, the trace outline of it, trying to hold it up against the light. So you can yeah. see. Um, so I just have a, a bunch of different copies from using different colors and overlapping different ways. And these bacteria take two or three days to really come up mm. in the ways that I want them to. So I should see them maybe by Tuesday if I just leave them on my bench. Awesome. Well, make sure that you share them with us. Yeah. Because I definitely want to tweet out about them. And but look, what cool things. This is what you were working on. We couldn't see it, but now we can. <laughs> yeah, so the... Bacteria just need to reproduce like a thousand times, more than a thousand times. Yeah. <laughs> Wait to have bacteria sex. That's, that's all they need to do. It's, it's as easy as that. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Jen. Thank you again for co hosting with me. And for anyone who is watching this live or in the future, thank you again for, for watching. Um, again, you can view uh, the archive on my YouTube or on my uh, Twitter, Periscope. Uh, and you can see the links to all of that stuff on my website at gaiusjaugustus.com slash sciart dash live stream. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you again. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thanks for having me. Bye.